Welcome, everyone. Good afternoon. How are you? Good. I have um, the distinct honor of welcoming um, Salam Mariati to campus today uh, at Vanderbilt. He is somebody whose work um, I've admired for a long time and been familiar with and also had a chance to get to know um, several years ago. We've become friends through the process, um, and I've learned a lot of I've learned a lot from him. So I'm really, really glad that um, Salam has traveled all the way from Los Angeles. And I say all the way because it's actually a longer flight <laughs> than I think a lot of people think um, um, from the West Coast to here. I hear I see somebody shaking their head in agreement too. So I've got before we get started, um, I just want to um, say a couple of thank yous. Um, starting with the Vanderbilt Project on Unity and American Democracy. Um, one of its founders is in the corner here in the right-hand corner, um, um, John Gear, And um, I have the privilege of serving as a co-chair um, with John Meacham and Governor Haslam as well of that project, um, which is the Vanderbilt Project on Unity and American Democracy is set up here to um, try to find pathways forward around unity, um, particularly in America today, in ways that strengthen our democracy. Um, and I also want to make sure that I thank the Muslim Public Affairs Council, which we're going to talk a little bit about that Salam started um, uh, many years ago, which we'll talk about that. Um, but thank you, and the impact team here that's also here. We have Lubna and Rebecca, um, if you guys want to wave, who are also with us. And then also the students at Vanderbilt who helped spearhead and, and put this um, uh, together. If you'll please stand, we have Dua, um, Ariba, and Sarah. Thank you guys for all the hard work that you put um, into this. So thank you. thank you. Big clap for the students. Um, so just to start on the first question here, I mentioned it, but you started Impact 35 years ago. Yeah, I think I was 10 years old. Yeah. <laughs> Can you tell us why you started it? And what year was that exactly? 1988. Okay. So it's actually going on 36 years. 36 years. Yeah. So I, you know, when I was in high school, my dad uh, told me, you know, I'm going to college, so I want you to pick the major that you like the most because then you'll be the best at that field. I said, great. And then he sat me down the next night and he said, okay, what have you decided? Are you going to be an engineer or a doctor? So I tried both, didn't like it. I actually was an engineer for two years. And then um, I met. What kind of an engineer? Chemical. Okay. And uh, processing wafer, like, you know, the computer chips for talking teddy bears and stuff like that, you know, really vital stuff. So, um, I, but I was also uh, very active with the Islamic Center of Southern California. I met a man named Dr. Marahatut, who was really, it was his idea. I, I was 20-something at the time. It wasn't my idea to start the Muslim Public Affairs Council, but I wanted to do work. And then in college, I actually got involved with the, a group named CISPIS, Committee in Solidarity with the People of El Salvador. Hmm. And that was at the time uh, of a lot of uh, policies in Latin America that ended up being very similar to the policies of the Middle East, supporting dictators that are pro-West but not real um, keen on human rights. Um, and the same in Southeast, Southeast Asia. And so my involvement with that group led me to more work uh, on issues involving our community. And, and so I, I thought that that's what I should be doing, not being an engineer. And I changed my career in 1986 joined the Islamic Center. I was actually probably the first full-time worker for the Islamic Center of any Muslim organization back then. Mm -hmm. There was no CARE, Council on American Islamic Relations. There right. was no Engage. There was no other national Muslim organization. So um, that led to the formation of the Muslim Public Affairs Council in 1988. And so, uh, I'm a lawyer, so words stick for me. So I want, I'm curious to know how you chose that name, Muslim Public Affairs Council, and then also what are you the most proud of? Some of the things, it doesn't have to be just one thing that you've accomplished over the past 35 years. And what are you most concerned by and reflecting on, oh, wow, I, I thought we'd mad made more cr progress than we've made today? Yeah, so in terms of the name, we were actually first called the Muslim Political Action Committee. Okay. And so that was MPAC. And uh, we realized at that time that that's not what we wanted to be because it's very narrow. It's you're raising money for politicians mm -hmm. and they and we found out very early on that politicians uh, most of them, uh, you know, th they're good people, but at the end of the day, they just take pictures with you, wave 
and then you know they're off and and when they get more money they do what the group that has more money want them to do not what we want them to do yeah. so Muslim Public Affairs Council was a broader uh, and deeper uh, kind of work in other words engaging government and media and civil society on issues that are important to us but ha develop that common ground and Dr. Mara Hattut uh, was the father of the American <coughs> of the American Muslim identity and he said that home is not where my grandparents are buried home is where my grandchildren are going to be raised. Mm. So the idea of home in America, and therefore Muslims needed a public affairs plan. Mm. We were very isolated and probably ghettoized, and to some extent we still are, in our own mosques, very insular. And you walk into a mosque, it's as if you walk into Karachi or Cairo or mm. Baghdad, or you know, and you have the good biryani or the good kebab, uh, in the place and people get together and talk about home, what's happening at home. And so the, the mosque became a place for homesickness. And, uh, and so it became a club usually run by men uh, that would talk about what's, what's happening but not doing anything. So the idea of MPAC was to instill that idea of civic engagement in each and every mosque and in each and every American Muslim and to say this is our home and we're going to fight for our rights and we believe we have something to offer America that will help enrich America and make Islam a vital enriching element of American pluralism. That's the idea of MPAC. Um, and the Saudis came and offered me $500,000 in 1988 to say, we want you to succeed, and if you just add a few board members to your committee, you know, we'll give you the 500000 So, you know, of course, we said no. We didn't even say no thank you. We just said no. And uh, turned out one of the <laughs> people that they wanted on our committee uh, served uh, a federal sentence for tr uh, being involved in some assassination plot of a Saudi prince. Wow! So those are the those that's are the, the one in D.C. a few years ago. Yeah. So that th that that's <laughs> those are the people that came to us first. MPAC then decided, I mean, at that time, from its from its inception, we are not going to take any foreign funding. We're going to be for the American Muslim community by the American Muslim community. And, um, and that's it, and our scope is America. It's not domestic only. Of course, America is involved in foreign affairs and it affects us domestically, but our focus is on enriching, protecting, supporting the American Muslim community, which leads me to what I'm most proud of, and that yeah. is our Young Leaders Program. Mm -hmm. We engage in policies, we engage in media. <coughs> we do a lot of work in Hollywood, and I'm sure you know about yeah, the Hollywood you do. work. Yeah, really in, good work. In, in Hollywood, uh, in terms of networking. And we, ha we have our policy work with you know, various administrations. I've spoken at the White House, I've spoken in the Congress, in the, in the State Department, met with all sorts of officials, but at the end of the day, it's really what I invest, what we at the Muslim Public Affairs Council do to invest our time with young leaders that really makes a difference for us. And hence why we're here today, is, yeah. is to talk about, uh, and that's the biggest concern we have, is future of our, of our students, future of, of campuses, future of our country that affects policy, obviously. Because to us, the, the anti-war movement, Vietnam, the civil rights movement, the anti-apartheid movement, they were successful, they were effective because of what was happening on our campuses. And now we feel that that's being suppressed um, and, and going against what the whole idea of a university is all about. University is about free thinking, critical thinking, exchange of ideas. Van Jones came up with a great point. He said, in universities, you should be physically safe but intellectually unsafe. Mm. And so when we see young leaders challenging the status quo and they're being uh, doxxed and penalized and targeted and, and, uh, and, and, and deal with, with prosecu uh, prosecution and persecution, to us, that goes against what America's all about. That goes against what the free press is all about. The free press is a counter to the government's status quo policies. It is, there should be not just a separation of church and state, but a separation of the media and the state. But now when you watch television, there's a quote unquote national security expert, former Pentagon person. He can tell you about all the bombs that we deliver. And I think people there, here in, in our society are saying we need, we need a different direction in terms of how we deal with media and government, and it starts with our young people. And so MPAC is very invested in supporting and protecting them, and very proud of the work that they've done on our campuses to 
to bring a, a real voice to the American people and, and, and what American values are all about. Yes. Yeah, so you recently penned an article in the L.A. Times, actually, about what's going on at USC and other campuses, too. Mm -hmm. And on that, and I think you're lending your voice to what does that vision moving forward look like? Um, and I was I'm, I'm hoping that you can for people who haven't had a chance to read the article, but, but also like, you know, there's only so much you can put in one article. Um, what are the three key points you're hoping that people are taking away when they read um, um, that article? I think the first point is what I just mentioned, that we should cherish our students. Mm -hmm. We should protect them, not penalize them, not target them, not exclude them, even though they are the valedictorian of the school. And because they have a one issue, is, and that's the one issue that's always, I don't know why, but it's always gotten us um, um, attacked and targeted. And it's because we have a different narrative on Palestine than what the establishment has. Mm -hmm. The establishment is pro-Israel. It is blindly pro-Israel. It, it is unwavering, uncritical. And then you come and criticize it. Then you, you become uh, an enemy of the state, not an enemy against America, but an enemy of the national security apparatus. Mm -hmm. My bank account could be frozen. There will be surveillance in our community. There will be um, so many things that happened to me simply because I don't believe in, in, in that Zionist narrative. And I'm not saying that a person can ha you know, shouldn't have a Zionist narrative. That's, you know, America's a free country. You can believe in whatever you want. But that's not what I believe in. I believe that Islam is, is the religion, really, that, you know, there's a story in the Quran that you're, you're f familiar with, Summer, that where the prophet went to Jerusalem and he ascended to the heavens and he prayed with all the prophets. Well, the significance of that story is that Islam believes in the unity of all these faiths. That, that we, at the end of the day, monotheistic faiths are all monotheistic, and we should be united at least in that understanding. You Christians can worship the way they want. Jews worship the way they want. They can believe whatever they want. Islam says we're supposed to protect all the monotheist, monotheistic faith, faiths, and that's what it did for 1,300 years, including uh, Jewish communities. In fact, uh, Omar the Second Caliph, when he came to Jerusalem, and and uh, the the Romans left, he was wondering where are the Jews, and the Romans had kicked had had wiped them all out. He brought Jewish families back. Uh, during the I Spanish Inquisition, Jews were persecuted. Uh, the Ottomans took about four hundred thousand Jews to become part of Muslim society. So, that narrative is unheard of, unseen unlearned, <laughs> if that's a word, it's not in our textbooks. When I open up a textbook for seventh graders, that whole history is blotted out for some reason. And so we have a long ways to go in understanding our narrative, I mean, having American understanding of what that Islamic narrative is, and there are Islamic narratives, but we need to make a space for it in America. And to exclude it and to say that this is anti-Semitic or it's anti-American or it's a threat uh, somehow to our national security uh, goals, uh, it, it's ridiculous, mm -hmm. to say the least. And so that is what we have to change, is to allow that narrative to become part of campus uh, uh, discourse, uh, media discourse, government discourse. And to this day, it is still suppressed. And anybody that comes forward and has that opinion is going to be targeted, is going to be criminalized, is going to be uh, isolated uh, and, and, and punished. And, and that is what we're trying to change. That's the policy we have changed. It. Last thing about national security, national, and that's the one thing that we really aim to change um, in, in our country here, is the national security policy. Because the national security policy as it stands is not securing Americans. It's harming more Americans. Obviously, it's harming Palestinians, harming Israelis, for that matter, harming so many people um, in the region. Uh, and and it's, a, it's a policy that, has, that is, is, is warped in, in time from uh, World War I with Sykes-Picot um, and the way the Middle East was carved up at the time. And the British may, gay, you know, implant, uh, supplanted leaders in different countries but they decided to keep Palestine for themselves for a reason, 
because to Islam and Muslims, Palestine is the heart of the Muslim world. It is the place where we call the land of the prophets. And, 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 and the British knew that that is something that they can um, affect the rest of the Muslim world by continuing to occupy Palestine. And then later on, we all know, know history after that. The last thing I want to say in terms of what we'd like to see more is that, you know, there's definitely uh, trauma that is taking place by witnessing a genocide and not being able to talk about it freely. Um, and, and, and again, all the uh, retaliatory uh, measures taken against uh, our students. And so that trauma needs to be addressed. Uh, we need to, to talk about mental health in, on our campuses and, and give people that safe space and counsel and, and also take it, take it easy with each other. Like we don't need to fight or throw things at each other, but really talk about how we can have a, a civilized discourse on this issue. And it should definitely start on our campuses. Well, that was rich. I mean, there's so much to unpack there. I have another, I had another question written, but before I get to that, um, I wanted to just ask, is the, is the frame right? Is, it, is the pro-Palestine, pro-Israel frame in this conversation the right one? Especially as, for example, almost one in four Israeli citizens identify as Palestinian. Uh, I think the answer, obviously, is it's not the correct frame. And, and, I think and that's could dialogue, an open dialogue correct. around this, help right. us get the right, the language right, right, so that we could actually find a way to disrupt these right. cycles of trauma that you're talking about? Correct. And, and, al and also, there are so many Jews now yeah. um, who are anti-Zionist or who, who are very critical, uh, especially of, the, of this Israeli government's policies, who, who are for a Palestinian state. You know, the one thing that really bugs me about the United States is that it doesn't want, you know, it, it's, it claims to be promoting peace in the world, but any nonviolent approach towards this problem, it just shuts down. Mm. You want to talk about, let's... This might, maybe it's making it worse. May, of course. And so there's a movement for Palestinian statehood in the United Nations. Everybody votes for it except the United States. Like, what, <laughs> you know? Mm -hmm. uh, uh, and, and it's just mind-boggling that, that we have people in the White House who continue to come to us and say, you know, we're really sorry about what's happening, and yeah, we're trying to help out, and, you know, and, and then they're sending weapons to kill more Palestinians, and they're vetoing resolutions to hold people accountable. We believe in human rights except when it comes to th this issue. We believe in separation of church and state except when it comes to this issue. We believe in international law except when it comes to this issue. Why is that? So, that it's, so I guess my, I'm leading, to, it's a long way, of getting to my point, that it's not pro-Israel, pro-Palestine, but what are, what are we as Americans right. doing about What are we as Ameri how are we talking about as Americans? Yes, put aside the religious label, the ideological labels, all that stuff. So how can we as Americans really have a conversation? We just p passed the bill sending, what, $26 billion more? At least. And, you know, as a famous singer says, we, we, we send money for war, but we can't send money for the poor. Mm -hmm. um, so that, that, that to me signals a need for us to have a discussion about it as first and foremost as Americans, American responsibility, American cul culpability, American vision for how we want to see the United States handle this issue. And I think most Americans, when they hear the words national security, they go, okay, well, we don't know how, what to do about national security. That's too... too that's too difficult of a topic. I'm not a policy expert on national security, so I can't say anything about it. Well, that's actually what the United States government does to give itself license for war. That's what it said it went to war in Iraq. Five to 800,000 Iraqi children under the age of five had, had, were killed, were killed. And st to this day, most Americans have no awareness that that's what our tax dollars went to do. That's, wh that's what our military so did. So I want to talk a little bit about that, too. So you're an Iraqi American. Mm -hmm. I'm a Palestinian American. Here mm -hmm. we are having a conversation. Um, both of our ancestors at one point were under British occupation. Um, do you see similarities? Between the, what's happening in Iraq and yes. Palestine? Yes. Absolutely. It's the same. It, 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 it's, it's a pol it, and that's what I mean by the United States government is stuck in a policy that started right after World War I. And it's like we tried to maintain this for the last 100 years. 
And now we see cracks in the wall, and, it's, and the dam is ready to burst, and we don't know what to do. Um, and, and, and the United States, at, at the beginning of World War I, by the way, most Arabs, Palestinians included, Iraqis, were pro-America because Woodrow Wilson had the, had the talk about self-determination. Right. And we're saying, oh, we now, if America is the new superpower, we'll be free. And the British is on the decline. Well, then we're going to be free. We're going to we're we're going to be good, right? Yeah, sure. And then, lo and behold, unfortunately, the United States government after World War II took, uh, in in some ways, even a worse direction. And the Gulf War was actually the first time that blood was shed by um, U.S. arms, um, because before that, the United States was not involved in, act in, in, in the active killing of people in that region. Um, so, mm. it, so that's when the United States was turned more into an imperial power okay. after that. And obviously what happened in Palestine it, it was part of an imperialistic uh, project. Uh, the last thing about national security from a domestic lens. Yeah. Um, Japanese-American internment. Mm. Um, when Korematsu, the case, that went to the Supreme Court, uh, filed his petition against um, that Japanese-American internment by the U.S. government. The government won, and the Supreme Court said, well, the government said they had to do it for the purpose of national security. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean by we need to start, as Americans, talking about this idea of national security that, go, that becomes a license for human rights violations abroad and repression here. And if I hear you correctly, you're saying that there are the cracks um, in a in a in a frame that was um, created a hundred years ago after World War One, and it's not working. And so we need to, from what I'm hearing you say too, especially on college campuses, we need to be engaging in open dialogue in order to find a way forward. And if we don't have these open conversations that, as you also mentioned, are nonviolent and are civil in discourse, depending on how we're going to define that, which I want to hear more about your thoughts on that, um, then uh, we won't figure out a way forward, and we'll just continue to repeat a status quo that is riddled with, quite frankly, that's, that's lethal. It's lethal. It's not serving American interests. Absolutely. Yeah. And so you were, if I'm also hearing you correctly, you were a student of the 80s. Yes. And you and and I'm looking here to not to point somebody out, but to point somebody out. We actually have somebody um, in the audience who also is from South Africa and was an and uh, and during that time was an anti apartheid activist himself um, here. Uh, and as you said that, I was thinking about your just kind of putting your you, you in historical perspective too, in terms of like when you're talking about students mm -hmm. and where you were as a student. Can you tell us a little bit about what it was like and were you involved in the anti-apartheid movement building in the 80s? Absolutely. Uh, so the first convention that I uh, organized was uh, in 1986, I think, or 87, one, around then. And we invited somebody by the name of Karen Bass, who was part of the African National Congress, Karen Bass is now the mayor of the city of Los Angeles. Oh, wow. So, um, so we go back that far. So I was involved in anti-apartheid, civil rights, uh, uh, human rights policies in, in Latin America, and I, I saw it all. That, right. And you had a guy named Elliot Abrams who was censored by the Congress. He lied to the Congress. He's the one involved in the Iran-Contra, yeah. selling arms to the Contras through Iran and, and, and continuing that, that problem. He was resurrected in 2000 <laughs> and became head of the national security team for uh, George W. Bush and was the architect of the war in Iraq at that time. Mm -hmm. So those are people I saw in 1980s on television, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm glad we got rid of him. And then they come back, and look what they're doing in the Middle East now. It's like they just want war. Yes, there's a military industrial complex, but we just can't write it off as, well, you know, people are making money and we're not going to be able to stop that. There's more to it than that. Yeah. And, um, and, and these, that's what I mean by the need to have conversations. And to me, th the university is the perfect place to have these conversations. It, it is designed to be a part of civil society that will be that buffer that is actually part of the checks and balances of what status quo government policy is. We cannot just be saying, well, you know, the president knows what he's doing and the national security team knows what they're doing and, 
and we just follow blindly. That it, those days are over. And I think that's why um, we need to have these conversations and allow th that, that safe space on our campuses. Yeah, and so here you are at Vanderbilt, um, which has not been immune to a lot of what you're talking about that's happening on college campuses. And just to um, just to state uh, a couple to kind of I know you're this is your second time in Nashville and your first time visiting Vanderbilt, so I'm going to yeah. kind of tell you a little bit about what's going on. Um, several students on our campus here um, have been um, suspended. Um, uh, some arrested, some expelled, and there are heated debates at the moment around the facts. Um, and the administration arrested a journalist for covering a protest on campus, um, and um, there was an attempt to bring charges against him for trespassing, and those um, that attempt was unsuccessful, uh, and he was released. Um, and the protest the journalist was covering was during a student election week on campus. Um, and the students wanted to vote on a res resolution regarding BDS. It was being placed on there um, through the Student Government Association. Um, and the administration said that if it passed, then um, and then if it decided to enact it, it would be a violation of Tennessee law. Um, and uh, note that not that the students voting on it would be. Um, and I'm sure that there are other students here who can add to or might want to add and other faculty members and administrators to what I've said. But let me just get um, from the audience. Do you think that my summary here of the facts thus far are accurate? OK. Yes. Well, first, it was a, a referendum for like the whole student body to vote on whether right. the student government would boycott, so not the whole university. Right, right, right. Yeah. and then. Um, the chancellor said it was um, illegal for us to vote on it. So yeah, we weren't able to vote either. That's it. Okay. And also we sit in the historic John Siegenthaler First Amendment Center, Center and mm -hmm. it seems appropriate to also, I think, note um, that Vanderbilt has, has historically struggled with racism. Um, as Los Angeles has to in USC, right. um, doesn't make it okay, but just like recognizing that because we do, we are we are coming into a time that I think it makes it difficult for us to, we inherit our past um, and we are where we are in this moment. Um, and so as an outsider coming in here today, what are your thoughts and observations about Vanderbilt? Uh, well, like you said, it's my first time here uh, so far lovely town charming uh i i love i love the architecture um and i'm looking forward to meeting with the students and of course i know you i've always had positive thoughts right. about vanderbilt because uh, because of you thank so you. um and, and and i know the work that you've done thank you um and and the fact that it is there's a center for you know free speech for constitutional rights for freedom of the press i walk in and the first sign i see is the the concept of protest that's an American tradition. Mm. Um, and I think it's time that we take our words more seriously and not just leave them as ink on paper. Uh, that's the end of democracy when you know, great quotes by thoughtful leaders throughout uh, the history of our country are just that. They're just in a museum, but they're not, they're not embraced, they're not manifested, they're not pursued. And I think that's where we're going as a country is the end of that pursuit of happiness. Mm -hmm. And so um, I hope that Vanderbilt can be one of those places where we have that idea of reinvigoration of, of these idea ideals. And I believe that American Muslims can be uh, an, an integral part of that process because we know, we know what dictatorships are like. Many of us came from, my, my family fled Saddam Hussein and, and the Ba'ath Party. Um, so we know exactly what tyranny is all about, and we don't want to see our country here um, move away from democracy. Uh, but the, the test now is how we deal with the Palestinian issue. The Palestinian issue is now an American issue. It's not just a Muslim, Arab, Palestinian uh, issue. It, you know, 70 percent, if not more, of American youth um, are against uh, the genocide in, in, in Gaza right now. Black clergy, I think what, about a thousand, a thousand of them uh, published an op-ed in the New York Times. So more and more people are becoming aware. Um, 
So I hope that when we, we talk about these wonderful centers, it's not just buildings with nice quotes, but it's real conversations, uh, bringing community partners, leaders, student groups, faculty, um, bringing them in. The, the problem with BDS, uh, again, it's becoming criminalized. Mm. And BDS is a nonviolent mm. part of, a, of resistance. And the more you, you shunt nonviolent resistance, then you're going you know, to expect the only option is left is violent resistance, and then you complain about the violent resistance. And that's what the United States is doing. Anything at the UN, anything in terms of global forums, anything in our Congress, they, they shut it down. Uh, and so the more they shut uh, nonviolent resistance, the more they radicalize. I mean, the war, the wars throughout the Middle East has radicalized the region. We all know mm -hmm. that, that wh what has happened there. So, so BDS to me is a form of non nonviolent resistance. Um, and, and while we are concerned about anti-Semitism, as well we should, we are not doing anything in terms of protecting Muslim students, pro-Palestinian students, all students, who take a position uh, for BDS or who take a position that our, our, our institutions, our academic institutions, should separate themselves from anything having to do with the genocide in Palestine. They, to me, these students are our conscience right now. And that is the most valuable treasure that should be cherished, should be protected, and should be nurtured. Also, I mean, I think it's important to um, point out, too, that many Jewish students are part of the Pal yeah the the pro Palestinian protest movements absolutely and I don't love that frame again because as I right. said I it's think but like just that. to but yeah, yeah but it's, I mean a lot of the the students by the way are not Arab or Muslim who are protesting right. a lot of them are um, people of all sorts all different backgrounds but they have they they there are ones who connect with this idea that Palestine is now um, the issue um, in terms of social justice. Um, and, and similar to how we're dealing with police brutality, similar how, how we're dealing with the suppression of, uh, of voting rights, all these issues, and now Palestine has, has become f uh, at the forefront for them. The ADL, unfortunately, the Anti-Defamation League, considered you know, one of the largest civil rights groups. Over 100 years. For 100 years, came out with a statement, and I don't wanna, you know, again, we shouldn't stereotype other people. It's Jonathan Greenblatt, their, their, their president, he made a statement that was very dangerous. He said that the Students for Justice in Palestine um, and, and all pro-Palestinian students should be investigated, student groups should be investigated for quote unquote material support of foreign terrorist organizations. That, and, and if you understand counterterrorism policy, there's a distinction between domestic terrorism and um, foreign terrorism. Domestic terrorists are actually protected by the First Amendment and, f and, and by the Bill of Rights. They, 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 can, they can go and talk all they want and demonstrate. They can do January 6th and, 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 and be, be viewed as, well, you know, they're just protesting and they have the right to protest and, you know, they're instigating a coup and they're okay, uh, kind of. Then uh, groups that come and support the Palestinian issue, somehow they're a threat to our society, they're existential threat. And so he uses the term foreign terrorist organization because there's a different designation, a different regimen of policies now that you can conduct surveillance on individuals and communities. And you I think a lot of people don't realize that. Yeah, go yeah. ahead. And you can, you can freeze their bank accounts and you can, uh, you can detain them uh, uh, without probable cause. And that is, that is unleashing the national security apparatus against a whole community. Yes, yeah, weaponizing it. Weaponizing. Uh, yeah, that's right. And I and and I would just note too to just kind of add on this um uh, a a, a, a close Israeli American friend of mine recently said that this um, positioning of pro-Palestinian versus pro-Israeli or anti-Palestinian versus anti-Israeli is a false frame. And that really the frame is but the issue is, and I want I'm curious if you if you agree with this, you kind of said it already in, in your in your words, but people who are peacemakers and who want peace versus people who are conflict profiteers or are, are warmongers. 
What's the question? What? So, so do you agree with the frame of is it really the two sides oh, here are not Palestinian versus Israelis, but rather people who want peace versus people that who think want that's war? That's an excellent frame. I, I agree with that. And by the way, just because you're a peacemaker doesn't mean you're not an agitator. I mean, Martin right. Luther King, you know, in his letter from Birmingham, Birmingham right. jail, he says, hey, I'm agitating because you can't negotiate with people that are supporting unjust policies. And if they're unjust policies, there should be civil disobedience. That's what he was all about. And he was viewed as a militant at that time. I mean, right now we romanticize, you know, Martin Luther King, what a great guy, and he wanted everybody to get along, and, you know, he wanted peace between, yes, he wanted exactly that. But the way he went through it, right. he says, I don't want negative peace where I acquiesce to racism and, and, and to um, injustice. I want positive peace, which is the peace with justice. Right. And that's the distinction. And if you want to talk about framing, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. Those who want positive peace, not negative peace. I like that. So tell me, what advice would you give university administrators at Vanderbilt right now? Well, I think, first of all, they should lobby the Tennessee state legislature that BDS should not be criminalized, mm. if that's the case in Tennessee. I don't know what Tennessee state law is, but I know it is in some states. Uh, but they should go and advocate for their students and say, our students said this, and I represent, if I'm an administrator, I represent the students. Right. You know, th they, they, are, they are what make universities universities. And last question before we open it up to the audience here, and that is, um, again, you see a lot of this as uh, Muslim versus Jewish framing. Oh, yeah, it's again. awful. I hate that. Right. Yeah. So, and also, there's not a lot of conversations about enough, I think, and more about... What does it mean to want to counter anti-Palestinian racism? What does it mean to want to counter anti-Arab racism? What does it mean to counter anti-Semitism? What does it mean to counter anti-Muslim sentiment? Mm -hmm. And as someone who has been working on these issues for the per past 35 years, and, and who went through 9-11, too, and the war in Iraq, and has witnessed the unfolding of the war on terror, what do you see now? What are you <laughs> observing? And what do you? What is your vision for all of us in doing this work with you moving forward? Um, if I get, if I come up with the answers, maybe you can help me write a book on that because I don't know uh, right right away uh, what the answers are. However, I'll, I'll give it a try. Uh, first of all, the Muslim Jewish framing is terrible. Uh, Muslim versus Jew. It's not Muslim versus Jew. It, it's about land. It's about rights. It's about people. So what are Palestinians wanting? Uh, they want what everybody wants. They want justice, freedom, and equality. And right now it's not working for them, obviously. And as you know, as many people here probably already know, there is a group called Palestinian Christians. And when you have the Muslim Jewish framing, you erase the whole history of Palestinian Christians, and Arab Christians for that matter, who have been part and parcel of that civilization for the last 2,000 years, and Islam did not eradicate them. Islam says, no, you're supposed to protect it. There are churches in Gaza. People were just amazed that there was a church in Gaza and, and, and Christians in Gaza. So um, th that's, that's number one. Number two, I, I see this, and I think I alluded to this earlier, it's just as much an internal threat to America as it is a threat to the Middle East. Mm -hmm. In other words, we are going through an existential phase of our society. Are we going to work uh, as a true democracy and include these voices and have real conversations, or are we just going to watch the Congress and the administration continue to fund genocide week in, week out? And that's like that's all they can do. They get, they, they they fund wars. They fund. You can't get a funding for homelessness in the Congress, but you can fund. A war over and over again, and then they complain about the debt uh, and the deficit. And uh, the other part of this existential issue is that is, th is America representing the, the people who are oppressed throughout the world? I mean, if you go to Washington now and you go to all the monuments, they talk about we are here to liberate, not to conquer. W okay, what does that mean? Does, does that have any value anymore? If if our democratic institutions are not serving our people, then they're not democratic institutions anymore. It's the, it's the beginning of the end of democracy. I think that is what I mean by you know, America going through an existential 
uh, phase. And it's just amazing that, you know, Donald Trump now is running as a peace candidate against Joe Biden. You know, that he's the one who's going to end endless wars, and he's the one who can make a deal between the Ukraine and Russia, and he's the one that can resolve all these. It's just mind-boggling that that's where we're at, and that's what our country, you know, having to choose between a president that has enabled genocide and somebody who's, I don't know what, <laughs> and we don't know what he's going to come with, that that's our choice for, for the presidency. So what I see is I think the Democratic National Convention is going to be interesting because in 1968, the Nas Democratic National Convention was in Chicago. Right. There was a war going on. Lyndon Baines Johnson stepped down because he knew he could not be elected during that war because there was so much sentiment against the war. Robert F. Kennedy should have been the presidential candidate, but he was assassinated by Sirhan Sirhan. Got you know, this terrible, terrible event in our, in our history. And the Democrats lost. And uh, now... We still have Biden who thinks he should be president. I think he should step down. I think it should be an open convention and find a, a candidate who represents the base of the Democratic Party. The base of the Democratic Party is against this genocide. And that, and that is, is some of the existential issues that our Democratic Party is facing right now. Powerful. You've given us a lot to think about. Thank you for Thank that. you. Let's open it up to questions. We've got 10 to 15 minutes. Oh, who is that person raising her hand? She happens to be one of our prides. Uh, she's a, a fellow at, uh, for our Congressional Leadership Development Program. Aha. Uh -huh. um, okay, so I had State a question. Your name. Um, hi, my name is Dara. Um, and so Vanderbilt has a kind of like principle of neutrality that they um, try to use. It's kind of like um, the chancellor's thing. Like he's he's like you know we were not going to make like a definitive statement on which side we support um, because universities sh should remain neutral to encourage dialogue and things like that. Um, however, there was an email sent out by the chancellor um, when the genocide first began um, where he um, didn't necessarily take a side, like said, oh, I'm pro-Palestinian, pro-Israeli, but he was like, you know, we stand with our Jewish students, we stand with um, our, our, you know, Jewish community on campus that's been affected by this. Um, and up until now, there's been no similar email like that, um, you know, showing support to Palestinian students on campus, Muslim students on campus who, like you said, are suffering our mental health. Um, it's a lot to have to be dealing with this, seeing our people getting massacred abroad, um, and then also having to deal with people on campus telling us that, you know, uh, that we're terrorists or whatever the, the case may be. Um, and then also now seeing that students are getting expelled for their views, um, you know, kind of what do you have to say to universities that promote this idea of neutrality um, but then refuse to stand against genocide when obviously, like, looking back, for example, a lot of universities um, did a lot of things that I know they probably regret during the civil rights movement. The uni this university itself expelled um, James Lawson um, and, you know, now has a building named after him, kind of, like, touting his, his legacy. Um, so, you know kind of how do you see the university looking back at the way that they handled the situation um, and what do you kind of have to say about this concept yeah. of neutrality? That's an excellent question. Um, yeah, and I think, I hope we can get to the point where, you know, when it punished Jim, James Lawson uh, back then and then cherished and, and celebrated James Lawson later, I hope we can get to that point for students who are being expelled now. I, I don't see that path. Uh, I see it going down even uh, a very slippery slope of enabling, acquiescing to, and supporting genocide. That's, so this idea of neutrality is not, it's not neutral. It's not neutral when you are punishing one side and you are threatening um, people's not only reputations, but their careers, their livelihood. Um, that's not neutrality. And then on the issue of neutrality, we were not, neutra we were not neutral on the issue of apartheid as students. We were not neutral on the issue of what was happening in Latin America. We were not neutral on the issue of civil rights. We were not neutral on the issue of war in Vietnam and how many millions of people were killed there. So, of course, and, and by the way, these administrators, some of them, I don't know about the administrators here, but you know, I, I remember having a discussion with Eric Holder. Eric Holder was the Attorney General of the United States, and there was a group called the LA, I mean the Irvine 11, who were 
arrested for protesting uh, an Israeli ambassador's speech, and then they were actually convicted. And you know how sometimes you get arrested? It's a misdemeanor. You go, they, they record it, and then you, you, you're let go after that. These people were, were, were charged with felonies. Never happened. And I asked Eric Holder, I said, you know, what do you think about that? And he goes, well, that's kind of weird because I used to occupy buildings when I was a student. Errol Southers of the University of Southern California, who's in charge of campus safety, he was involved in, 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 in the cancellation of the Muslim valedictorian, uh, Asna Tabassum. And he told me, yeah, I used to occupy buildings. So it's, there's, there's a hypocrisy. And I'm not, I, you know, these are good friends of mine. I don't want to. I'm not s mentioning them, you know, to insult them, but I'm just saying I, I don't understand this mentality that th there's a generation that, are you know, administrators in our campuses that were occupy occupying buildings, that were protesting, because that's what students do, right? If you really make want to make a meaning meaningful experience in campuses, you get involved in these issues. Either you debate people or you go a protest and you you know you feel like you got to do something that's what they did and now they're punishing students who are doing that or allowing the punishment of students who do that um, and, and so I, I would just I would just challenge this idea of neutrality that you cannot my conscience will, will not allow me to be am I neutral on the Holocaust no so if I lived in you know at that time I would be fighting against them and the Germans Unfortunately, they committed, you know, they committed a, a war crime, war crimes against the Jewish people then, and now they're enabling war crimes against the Palestinians by sending weapons to eliminate uh, Palestine as we know it. So, I, you know, this idea of neutrality, I was never, I, I, I never bought into that. And, um, and if they want to be really balanced, if that's really what they mean, then they would be supporting and protecting students who are on, on that side of, you know, uh, uh, of opposing the genocide. Uh, Fani. Thank you. It's fine. Um, uh, Mr. Al Mariati, Fani de Toy from Cape Town, South Africa. Um, uh, first of all, I just want to acknowledge um, the bravery of the students on this campus who have stood up uh, against um, against what seems an overwhelming. Uh, onslaught and uh, I didn't know about this personally until I arrived a few days ago and I was taken on a, t on a tour around the campus and I was mightily impressed by what these students have been doing. Um, I secondly want to say that I'm glad uh, you didn't become an engineer and that uh, that that you... My dad did not but anyway it's, uh, it's okay. <laughs> I'm sure we... Uh, but he's proud of our, our I work I could now. bring him yeah. around to that uh, yes. at some point. But then um, also, as a South African, I just want to assure these young people that you have a friend in South Africa, that we stand by you, that we are in solidarity with you, that we see your struggle, uh, we see the neglect uh, of your humanity, we see the way the world is treating you. And, uh, you know, I'm a white South African. Uh, I grew up under apartheid as a beneficiary of apartheid. I'm a Christian. And so, you know, there's every reason for me to be in the other camp if we want to go into those, uh, that terminology. But the country uh, and the commitment to human rights for everybody has taken me in a different direction direction now where I can clearly see through my white eyes, my Christian eyes, the injustice, the fundamental injustice that is being done to the Palestinian people. And so, and I would say South African students by and large are supportive of your struggle. Uh, we love you. We, we can't wait for the day that you liberate it. And we will do everything we can to support the struggle. Um, I'm proud of the country for going to the court and to put that on the international agenda. I think, incidentally, that is a big step forward for international justice to, to, to actually be able, from a small country, to challenge the might of this country. I also want to just remind you that you are in the eye of the battle. 
here is where the cultural arguments are being formulated that support the current situation in the Middle East. And you are in the eye of this battle and, and know, by and large, the rest of the world are with you. You are in the majority. Um, there has been people who've said to South Africa, why do you go out on a limb here? you know, against uh, your number one trading partner and your number two trading partner. A and South Africa has answered, actually, we're not going out on a limp. We are actually representing what we think is a growing majority of people in the world. And so, so, so my own view is that it is a question of time. I also just want to say the sorrow, the sorrow I feel personally and and my family and all of us for the people of Gaza and and that our thoughts and prayers are every day with all of those people and with you indeed finally I do not think governments change uh, Mr. Al Mariati uh, through logic logical arguments not even moral arguments right. there are two things that make governments change the one is um, strategic interest, and the other is embarrassment. And in South Africa, what, m what made the West withdraw their support from apartheid was a combination of the end of the Cold War and embarrass embarrassment with the actions of the apartheid government that became increasingly um, uh, oppressive. So I think we need, to, we need to really, where we see people not living up to the values that we know we want to see as governments, we need to embarrass them. Embarrass them to the point where they will change course. And, uh, and I think for the large majority of people out there, this is already a fait accompli. Final thing just from my side, and sorry it's been long, but I just wanted to get it off my heart. Desmond Tutu in South Africa said, if in a time of oppression you, st you are neutral, you're actually standing with the oppressor. He was clear on that. So I think this is, uh, this is quite simple. I think, uh, I think uh, we need to challenge also the university authorities on that. But thank you very much. Thank you. And all our support to you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. It's very, very heartwarming to hear that. Um, just want to let you know that we did honor the South African um, foreign minister at the embassy in, in Washington, D.C. Uh, we actually had two events, one thanking the government of South Africa for doing something that no Arab or Muslim country could do. To, uh, to us, they were more Islamic uh, in terms of working for, for justice than any of these uh, Muslim, so-called Muslim leaders. And, and what a shame, which is also part of the problem. Um, that we have leaders in the Middle East especially that don't represent, it actually are actively suppressing uh, the sentiment of their own people. But South Africa, because of its experience and, and the, the history of anti-apartheid movement and, and obviously the, the figurehead and the intellectual resource of Nelson Mandela, such a beautiful human being, uh, I think is true to its word. And that's, that's the one thing we can count on um, and um, now there's, there's a congressional resolution, I believe, I, f I forgot, maybe my staff will tell us what the number is, but there's a resolution that is aiming to punish South Africa for taking the case to the International Court of Justice. Uh, and, and, and I think taking something like 10 billion or 15 billion dollars in trade away from South Africa. And we have to fight that. That's part of the fight as well. Um, and, and it shows that we're all together uh, on this. So I, I hope th this is, 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 we can educate people on campuses. This is where we, we do the work uh, to educate people about it, to push back against that, um, that policy of punishing South Africa. And lastly, I agree with you. You know, governments don't change just because of morality or logic. They change because of pressure. And I see now that within the Democratic Party, there is more pressure that's building up. And unless these people um, change, th then we should, we should replace them with, 
with leaders who represent our values, and the same for the Republican Party for that matter. So that's the only way they're going to they're going to deal with change. And we see now, you know, that bill that was passed for the foreign aid package, the military aid package to, to Israel and, and the Ukraine. Even though it passed, there was a record number of members of Congress opposed to the bill. For the first time, it it surpassed 50 members. It's like it was like 65 members who actually were opposed to it. We have never seen that before. So there there is some movement there. There are some members, more members of Congress that are listening to their constituency, but we have to keep that pressure up, I agree. Let's do one last question right here. Hi, okay, so um, I just wanted to first make a comment. I really resonated with um, what the gentleman from South Africa said. Sorry, I didn't catch your name. Um, but I also just wanted to say, like regarding the summary of events given earlier in the talk, um, I think one of our biggest issues that we face is that our administration constantly pushes this idea of dialogue and pushes the emphasizes that you know our principal neutrality allows for open dialogue but um then we see our administrators especially high level administrators like our chancellor refuse to even speak with our students for justice in palestine or our uh divest coalition about the referendum or um even about the so-called illegality of the referendum I also want to clarify that, as what we said previously, the referendum uh, is voting about whether our student government should divest or should boycott, not whether we should have full university divestment. And in the state of Tennessee, our student government's budget is underneath the the limit that the law sets. Um, underneath two hundred thousand dollars. Yep, two hundred thousand, and the law sets the limit of two hundred fifty thousand. But I want to say regarding what the gentleman from South Africa said. Um, that our governments don't change based on morality, and the same is true of our universities. They'll never change out of morality. They'll change out of embarrassment and pressure. And that's why when we don't see a space for dialogue and we don't see a space for uh, like Palestinian voices on campus to be uh, expressed, that's why we see all this pressure building up, right? And I also wanted to get your thoughts on um, how we combat this framework that protesters on campus are against dialogue uh, when we're not given the space to express uh, what we actually want. Can we combine the, uh, that's a great question, and can we combine it with, I wanna give, someone had one other question back here and I really wanna make sure you get a chance to ask it. Was it you who asked you? Yes. So we'll hold space for two questions. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Hello. Uh, my name is Hunter. I'm a uh, senior here at Vanderbilt. I'm about to graduate in a couple of weeks, which is crazy. But for me, and I feel like, and I have a hunch for a lot of people in this room, there is a life like kind of pre the, what's currently going on. I would say October 7th, but I just hate that that's the framework of this entire narrative is October 7th. So I hate saying pre-October 7th, but I feel like there's a genuine before and after moment in my life of like what's currently going on in Palestine. And I feel like society at large, that's what's going on too. You see it's affecting um, political issues, it's affecting activist issues, and even economically, like you can see that its impacts. There's a definitive before and after. And for me personally, ever since, what's currently going on has started going on. It's kind of tainted my experience at Vanderbilt a little bit, and I feel like I'll be graduating with a little bit of um, kind of like a profound sadness that this is what the end of my undergraduate education is coming to, because at every step of the way, and there's this narrative that administration will try to paint of protesters that we're aggressive or we're, we're pushing boundaries, but Every step of the way, honestly, we've just reacted with, honestly, to what is happening, the calmest, most peaceful way of responding to how we see our university is systemically tied in this very issue. And yes, there's lots of anger, because who's not going to be angry about that, about the fact that our university in some ways has financial ties to and is complicit in genocide. I mean, I don't check the numbers every day anymore, but 
I think the last time I saw it was like 34,000, but even that's an undercount because imagine all the people in the rubble and it's just, it's a gross miss. For me, this is the societal defining moment of people in college right now, young people especially, who pay attention to large scale political issues unlike ever before. And I just don't know what, what I'm supposed to do when every moment when we do something peaceful, we get pushback from the people in power, the people who, at this university, honestly, sh their interest should be students, not, not their donors, but it's been obvious with their reaction. And obviously just the reaction to power structures in general, like politically, societally, economically, and universities are complicit in that power structure, is they're more likely to side with the establishment on this issue because the establishment for, since the creation of the state of Israel has been one-sided and pro-Israel. And, and I mean, it's such a complex history, but you don't need to know the entire complex history to, I mean, the day after the attack happened, I knew that Israel's response was not what it should have been. It's, I, I think early on in the conflict, the, it was like you don't respond to an attack with like the scorched fire tactic. And that's what it's been. And then I feel like a lot of people have become more aware of the nuances of the actual history and realizing that this isn't, this is how Israel has always reacted to um, Palestinian resistance. So I don't know, it's like, I know educating myself is helping and all that's help, helping, but um, I really, and I'm honestly struggling going to graduation because I'm weirdly behind in classes because this entire issue has affected my mindset. It's like an entirely psychologically different s mindset I'm in now than I was before October 7th. And I will say the only thing that's like saved me and saved me from going insane is like, um, so I, I did introduce myself to Salam Alaikum because um, something that I've seen from the Palestinian people is I feel like I've been finally, as a white American, authentically introduced to Islam. And so through the Palestinian people and their struggles, I mean, young people around, we see videos from Palestine every day on social media apps like TikTok. It's honestly crazy that we can just view that on our phones, but we see it. And one of the first things I remember seeing from these people are, is their faith. And despite their persecution and struggle, them sitting steadfast in their connection to God or to Allah's, I have now known to call him, which I like. I like that name. If you actually look into it, it it's a cool name. Anyway, sorry. But so that's the only thing that's really been saving me is kind of this, it's, it's a connection to the Palestinian people that I've built but also like an understanding, it's completely restructured just the way I view life and it seems like everything's so calm under the understanding of Islam and I was wondering if you also think there might be like a spiritual connection with, I don't, if, if that makes sense because, or just like how the West has viewed Islam throughout history and I was just wondering um, if there's any, I sorry about that, I'm that sorry, no, sorry. No, 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 I, I just also wanted to, want to add, which is very interesting, just if I may. Um, um, you know, Palestinian Christians also will pray to Allah. Allah is the one of the Arabic names for God. And I just wanted to point that out because I think sometimes we forget that connection. And I also just don't want to, I want to make sure I have a lot of, um, I have a lot of Palestinian Christian um, neighbors and brothers and sisters as well. And I want to make sure that, and increasingly they feel sometimes erased by the dialogue around this issue. And I, again, I just want to bring that to the forefront. Um, and I'll give you just a quick story of my own self, because you know we have so many. Now, Arabic is the third largest spoken language in Nashville. And I was on a plane coming back to Nashville. I don't remember where I was coming back from, but a few years ago. And there was a book, and the woman was clearly reading it and was praying. And I assumed it was the Quran. And then I took a closer look, and it was the Bible. I'm glad you said that. Thank you. Um, yeah, and also, uh, you know, I, I don't know what you're going through as students, because I'm not a student. I, yeah. I was one many years ago, uh, and uh, what you're going through, it, 
looks horrific. I, I, I know I talked to the students at USC, University of Southern California, what they're going through. I talked to the students at UCLA, what they're going through. When you don't feel that the administration has your back and in, but actually is attacking you uh, from the back or from the front, th that, th that, that is a terrible situation to be in. And I'll do whatever I can, and our organizations are trying to do whatever we can to, s to support you, to support the students. And I'm glad you brought up the issue of Palestinians because nobody is suffering as much as the Palestinians themselves. I mean, what we're going through is nothing compared to what they have gone through. And yet I see video after video of Palestinians speaking with hope, you know, with, with uh, trust of God. Um, there was one video, here's a girl, she must have been like eight or nine years old, and everything is destroyed around her. And the, the interviewer asks her, what, what are you thinking right now? What would you like to be when you grow up? She says, I want to be an engineer. There's somebody who can be an, a, a real engineer. Um, because when I'm an engineer, I can rebuild the school and the hospital and the houses. Um, and so imagine being in that situation, but you still have a vision uh, for hope. That, to me, is amazing faith. Um, what did Amer you know, uh, slaves go through? You know, what, would go what was going through the mind of Frederick Douglass and Marcus Garvey in fighting racism and slavery um, and, and exploitation uh, during their time? Um, Malcolm X and, and Martin Luther King. Nelson Mandela, ag again, we, we think of these heroes as if, oh, they're just great people and how wonderful they were. Well, they suffered a lot. They sacrificed a lot. S s and obviously, many of them sacrificed their lives for this cause. And so that should give you hope, that should give you inspiration, that should give you a sense that this is, this is bigger than me. You know, when you're flying on a plane and you see, you look down and you see these small boxes, that's a home. But when, so when you're looking at it from there, it's just a speck. But when you're in the room, when you're in a house, oh, it's, 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 it's the center of the world. It's everything to you. We have to have perspective on where we are as it relates to this movement for justice. We, we are just there to move the ball five yards and the next group will come after us and move it uh, some more. It, we're not it. We're just mechanisms, instruments for justice, for this voice. And if that's all we can do, have a voice and preserve that voice, then that's what we, we do. If we have political influence and are able to embarrass a politician or two, by all means, do that. Economically, get these Muslim governments, Arab, Arab governments, to work with South Africa, if we can do that, by all means. Western governments, Gandhi was asked, what do you think of Western civilization? He said, that would be a good idea. If we can get people to be more civilized in the name of Western civilization, by all means, let's do that. We do what we can do, what we're able to do. But whatever that little thing that we can do, we must do, and we must continue to do and strive. The Quran talks about striving. I, you know, keep marching on and strive for the cause of God. That's the best thing for you if you only knew. So that, that, that struggle in and of itself, and even in sports, they say, yeah, the, you know, when I get the trophy, that's a nice event. But that struggle that we took on the way to the championship, that's something I will never let go of. That's something I will cherish for the rest of my life. And I think what you're going through on campus is a struggle but it, it's something that you will look back on and say, this is what built character in me. This is what made me who I am today, a father, a, uh, an uncle, a worker, a boss, whatever, a political leader, a civic uh, uh, participant. It made me who I am today, and therefore God gave me that opportunity of the struggle that, that I should never let go of, I should always cherish. To me, that's the spiritual, spiritual connection. When Moses met with God, what did God tell him? Here, here's, here's a prophet who can't, who you can't get closer to God than that, right? He's with God. And, and God says, you better go back down because your people are suffering from a test. 
It's like, why did you, why'd you come in haste to meet with me when you need to be with your people? So that, that's the message, is to be in community, be with people. That's what, what being close to God is. And then the last thing in terms of uh, dialogue, yeah, we have something called faith washing in interfaith groups, where interfaith dialogue is used to whitewash the crimes committed against the Palestinian people. But does that mean that we don't engage? No. Again, our book, the Bible, the Torah, all, all these great books say you are here to serve humanity. You are here for the sake of human dignity, and therefore you must engage. And so where there are allies on campuses, on universities, where there are allies in government, including the Congress or the State Department or even the National Security Council or people who are at least willing to listen to what you have to say uh, or allies in, in media and Hollywood now, it is our responsibility to deliver the message and to build partnerships because we cannot do it alone, obviously. But we can be part of that leadership that makes America true to what its foundation is, its foundations you know, that in the Constitution. We should not allow people to shred the Constitution before our very eyes. We should resist that first and foremost and preserve the Constitution. We, the people, here to form, uh, to uh, form a perfect more important, thank you. To, you're the expert. To form a more perfect union, establish justice. That's the cornerstone of our work. And I know we're over time, but I just wanted to say one thing and then give you the last word, and that is, Hunter, to your question, too, about the spiritual nature of the place. Um, and I know one person, I know the answer to one person in this room to this question I'm about to ask. How many of you have been to the Holy Land? So uh, less than five. Um, what I will say as someone who's been going there since I was three years old, some of the um, most peaceful moments of my life have been in Jerusalem, have been in Ramallah, have been in my family's village of Der Dibwan. And um, it's an overwhelming spiritual experience that I hope that everybody in this room gets a chance to have. And if you talk about Palestinian hope, this one of my, I remember too as a little kid being there when there wasn't barbed wire um, all over the place and then there weren't checkpoints everywhere and when um, there wasn't what it felt like was just um, police in so many places, uh, and there's nothing nothing wrong with police, but I mean, what I mean to say is with, it could just, uh, with what, machine guns in some of the most sacred places for Abrahamic traditions and faiths. And it wasn't there, which means that it doesn't have to always be there. And that's kind of the hope and the vision that I would say is what would it be like in thinking about that to walk around Jerusalem again without there being so much of a police state presence as you're walking through that journey and that spiritual journey to experience your faith. And again, just to say, it is a very, and, and that I will say though too, and in recent times, I have experienced a, a certain feeling of peace and calmness from even being there. And there is obviously a lot of irony in that, in that, and feeling that with everything that is going on around you. But it is a spiritual place. And it's a place for, in my opinion, that the more people can feel that spiritual connection, as many people as possible, making it accessible. That's what religious freedom is also is about, is for as many people to feel like they can access that on this earth as possible. Yes, and we have a Palestinian here in the audience. Yeah, I, I appreciate you talking about the spiritual like experience that you had in Jerusalem. 
But as a Palestinian who was born in Palestine yeah. and grew up there, I've never seen a life without the apartheid wall or without checkpoints. Yeah. And my only time experiencing Jerusalem was when I had to get my visa to come here, when they allowed me to be there. So in order to get... And to that was your only time. That was my only time. And in order to be able to experience this like spiritual experience that you're talking about, that's why we need to advocate for a free Palestine because otherwise nobody would be able to even be there. Uh, right. And that's that yeah. access point for every single person possible to access it without barrier. And it's what's so interesting too is the time I'm talking about of walking around. Do you know when that was? You know which decade? I'm going to date myself. The 1980s. Well, I mean, I, and I agree. I think our job, I every religion's job, you know, you read about Moses and Pharaoh and children of Israel. You re read about Jesus and, and the Roman Empire. You re read about Muhammad and the Quraysh. Their, their job is to liberate people. And, and we start liberating people from racism from apartheid, from uh, slavery, from economic exploitation, and that's our job. And let it let it be uh, a lesson for us to help all people, not just not not just in this issue, but there's oppression throughout the world, um, and and our job is to fight that oppression and and to start from here at the United States as Americans to um, to work as as we say as we used to say. In, when I was uh, back in school in the 60s, I'm dating myself, um, liberty and justice for all. What does that mean? That, that should not just be words um, that, that are chanted, but words that mean something. So that's, that I, I, I feel like this is, this is just another starting point. I've gone through so many starting points in my, in my work. Here's another starting point for being involved in a liberation struggle. And, and I'm very proud to be part of that, that liberation struggle. And I'm proud of all the work you do. And I'm very thankful for the university at least offering the opportunity for this, this conversation. Thank you all. Mm -hmm.